we're having a look here at the Napoleonic Battles system, which was designed by Joseph Miranda for the May 1992 Strategy and Tactics magazine, number 151. You have a picture there of General Udino, which tells you something about it, um, it uh, basically being on the Battle of Friedland. Now, the reason why I'm detailing this old um, thing, which I haven't found much about, um, is that uh, at first um, look, it contains some very, very different and well, quite different, at least, and interesting situations. So my question is, is if it was intended as a system, why was this the only um, battle portrayed in it? Why did the system not get picked up? So going in, that's what um, I'm going to explore in this video. I'm not going to sort of portray the game um, or go through gameplay. I've just finished um, a game of the main scenario and in fact I played the sort of introductory scenario which was um, lands holding action uh, and I, f I finished the main um, scenario. You're also offered a, an extra scenario where you can fight a second day so normally the battle was on the 14th of June was concluded and that offers you 15th of June um, so you've got all these turns, the blue ones are night turns, so I started here and would have ended here, but we ended, I think it was here, um, with a French victory. Um, you have uh, these boxes just to show the player, visibility, weather, and then that's the sequence of play. Now visibility and weather is interesting, that's an interesting thing which they bring into it, you don't often see um, detailed in Napoleonic grand tactical games or even tactical games. Um, so that's the first interesting thing. I'll detail that a bit more. Um, just to say that I know nothing about the game um, and I know nothing about the Battle of Friedland before coming to um, this game. So um, I'd just like to sort of talk a little bit about the situation then, the Battle of Friedland as a choice as a game before I move on to the Napoleonic battle system. Now this was interesting because um, you start here, you have the River Alley, which is um, uh, prohibited for movement. So the um, Russian player starts on the uh, west side of the river and the, the town of Friedland is detailed here. And then the French come on from this direction. I read a little bit on Wikipedia about it subsequent to my play and I understand that the Russians were kind of basically holding these heights. So you, you have set up kind of like areas uh, where you, you can set up within one hex or within the area. So there's a bit of um, variability in your setup. But either way, um, the Russian player sets up with his back to the river. Now within Friedland, there's um, one coming off from Friedland, there's one two, three, four bridges. Some of them, I understand, were pontoon bridges built by the Russian army prior to the battle. But the point being that um, with their back um, to the river, they had basically committed themselves under Bennigsen um, to take on the French, and then the French brought on more than they could chew and were decimated. So going into the... Uh, that would, if that if a game was just like that, and you had to play out that scenario, then it would be a, a typical kind of desperate defence. How long can you hold on until you achieve the victory conditions? Probably with, with any competent French player, the Russians would be um, completely knackered at the end of it. Um, but it's more open than that. So um, essentially the game plays with a victory on sending the enemy army to their disintegration point and or um, t uh, destroying a certain number of their combat factors. Now that is an interesting point which this game does as well is that often you attract disintegration by say morale points or combat factors um, but this distinguishes two so you can win like a marginal victory by disintegrating the army, a tactical victory by destroying a certain number of combat factors, so actually, you know, destroying enough men and material, and you get a, a total victory by achieving both those aims. So you could achieve one, which 
as I did the um, French achieved Russian army disintegration. So actually think about it, I could have pressed on and uh, tried to achieve an even more impressive victory or being threatened because of the, the fact the French were closer to, dis to disintegration too. So yeah, that's um, an interesting point. Uh, what happens when an army disintegrates? Well, it kind of uh, is a lot sort of softer and t t just tends to get pushed back. That wouldn't have been too bad for the... Um, So yes, in the situation I had it, that wouldn't have actually necessarily been too bad for the Russians because being on the other side of the river with many, having blown many bridges, they would have had a chance to filter off the map edge and perhaps stymie the French for the victory, um, or more decisive victory. Um, but yeah, so about the Battle of Friedland, it was... When I saw where the Russians were set up, and I knew that the French were coming on here, um, and knowing, um, well, you know, suspecting that the Russians were going to, being although being big and strong, not necessarily being so um, efficient or or sort of sturdy, um, they would get a pounding and then find their their backs against the river and then undoubtedly be eliminated for failure to rout, it's that kind of thing. You don't actually have that in, in this game, but that kind of thing. Um, so I immediately thought, right, we've got to get on the other side of the river and then tease the, the, the French <laughs> towards us and uh, give them a thorough beating, A, with our much more um, numerous artillery, uh, and see as they try to, to ford, um, not ford, but come across the river. And so um, the French would have a chance to do that. And in fact, they in, in the game I played, they were just managing over here. Um, maybe if I move a bit closer, we can get a bit more detail of the actual action. So... That's a bit grainy because of the light. I hope that's better. Um, so I was using this to denote that the um, each side has an engineer unit. You can build a bridge. Um, even with an enemy on the other side, it's, it's still possible. And uh, so uh, Ney was, had just built a bridge here under the direction of Napoleon. Napoleon was just moving back to bring in Bessieres and the Imperial Guard. Then he was going to go and pick up um, Victor's first corps. And they would... Um, charged through here while Mortier and the um, 8th Corps would have mopped up s some remnants of the, the Russians around here. But meanwhile the Russians have been busy blowing bridges so I'm using these to mark blowing bridges. Being a magazine game there's a restriction and also two games the same magazine there was a restriction on the number of counters. So I just cropped off some of the sprue and uh, used it to, to denote pontoons and blown bridges but anyway so um there's one bridge left and there was a guards cavalry unit here could possibly have moved in held that bridge for the french so they, they would have had a chance but then again like i say the russians would have been able to send in a lot of artillery fire and resist their advance at least more effectively than they would have standing in front of the river um, so that's how the Battle of Friedland turned out for me. Very unhistorically, the um, Russians promptly retreated as they saw the French coming behind the river. Um, now, I say promptly, and that's where the interesting things in this game, one of the interesting things in this game comes in, um, in that they weren't very prompt. Um, I will just show you to... Um, so here we have, this is a unit from the French right wing. And this is a unit from Mortier's 8th Corps. And you see the circled um, letter C and F denotes um, a leadership rating. Now each unit has a leadership rating, each leader has a leadership rating. If a unit's on its own, it has to use its leadership rating. If it's um, within range of a commander or, and or army commander, it can use their rating. But basically, um, the ratings go from 
A, B, C, D, and F. So genius, that's Napoleon, good, that's Benigson, um, and uh, Victor, and then standard, that was most of the other um, French commanders, and then D, aggressive, like Ney, aggressive and lethargic, that was most of the um, uh, f Russian units and Russian commanders. And you also have morale ratings, elite, veteran, trained, and rabble. So each unit, just going back to this one, you can see the V denotes that's a veteran unit. It's got four combat factor and four movement factor in their normal places on the Russian right wing. Now, because um, the Russians uh, started here, um, a big body of them, their, their right wing started here. That's these yellow fellows. And they were moving back. Now, a big, very big force, uh, typically, you know, with the Russian sort of ad hoc formations, they formed, they had a small left wing and a very large right wing, and with one commander for each. So not all the right wing were in their commander's range. He brought many of them back. You can see these yellows up here. And there's some more there uh, hidden under the fog of war. Some were left isolated, and there were, in fact, two more which were eliminated. So... um. Being F lethargic, it was very difficult to get them to move out the way. So, um, so going back to the rules, what is interesting about this game? Well, the first thing is for this era is it uses a D10, which is interesting, not the usual 1D6. So you get a broader range of, um, and the more random sort of possibility with that. They do allow you to use 2D6. In fact, they include a table for that dice conversion chart which gives you more of a bell curve. It's, um, and I think that's in case you didn't have a D10 in your collection. So that's the first thing. The second thing is those leadership ratings and how they work. Um, and the reason that, that is it's not just sort of like um, A is genius is automatically better. I mean, it is more or less like that. Essentially what happens is um, you, you have the leadership table, you have... Um, the leader and you roll the die. Now if you're genius and um, the units in your command are in command between 1 and 8, on a 9 only units in your hex are in command and on a 10 they're out of command. Um, and you have to declare beforehand so um, you, you, what you can is, is you can have like a corpse leader in, a, in an army leader's span can use the army leader to activate trouble is, if he doesn't activate, then you're all out of command. The, the um, corpse leader doesn't get a chance again later. So you have to make some decisions like that, especially um, with the Russians, because their advanced guard, um, the advanced guard leader who was, where is he? I've forgotten who that was now. Bagration is a, has a better rating than Ben Eggson. Um, but he uh, Benigson has a has a greater command span. So, but anyway, yeah. So genius is like that. Good is like that. But you get an I, and an I is impetuous. So in command, impetuous or out of command. So in command, you may move normally if you're rolling for movement. After army disintegration, reaction checks, engagement checks, and cavalry pursuit. So that would all be fine, but impetuous, you must, you must, you must. Out of command, may not, etc. Um, and so you go down, and standard sort of is the great genius good standard with that variable results. And then you get to aggressive. So aggressive has got lots of impetuous results. And a lethargic, as you can imagine, has no impetuous results. And in fact, for those lethargic units, they don't activate themselves on a bracketed C. So they were only activating on a 1 or 2 on a D10. So you can see lethargy can be, if, if, if it's bracketed again, if you're with the commander stacked, then, then you could move. So you can see how that command control, combined with the leadership role, um, creates a lot of interest in how your formations are moving around, especially when you have, again... Um, the Russians essentially have um, a right wing, a left wing, an advance guard, and then a reserve, and then Cossacks. Um, whilst the, the French are more, have more mobility, you know, they have their course structures. 
each with their own horses, its um, artillery and infantry. So before I forget, I'm just going to while I speak about infantry, I'll just bring another interesting thing in. And I'll detail it with the advanced guard units because you get some of both is um infantry comes in two types like this so this is your standard infantry and this infantry has skirmish capability now why is that important well that brings us on to another really interesting point in the game which are the combat tables so um these are the combat tables you have one two three four five and six there's one artillery bombardment and then two cavalry, you have cavalry probe and cavalry charge. Then you have infantry skirmish. So if you have skirmish capable um, infantry units, they can roll on that table. Otherwise, no. Then you have linear and you have column. So you can make a choice which combat table you use. And they um, have quite different outcomes. So this is the range of combat results. I circled each one. So there's quite a large range of combat results. You know, some only apply to um, certain tables like X is point blank fire. So if you're firing at one hex range, then the enemy lose uh, as an elimination. Um, for, you know, canister and whatnot. Um, but most are, are available. Uh, well, and also then, for example, on the skirmish and the cavalry probe, you have a W, which is a withdrawal result. Now, that's very interesting because... Um, uh, there's no zones of control as so called in this um, system but there are, are zones of engagement which essentially is a zone of control but what it means is that once you're in it you are engaged and you cannot move out until A you eliminate the enemy or they retreat out or you get that withdrawal result so on a withdrawal result the attacker is able to move out of um, the zone of engagement so um Skirmish capable units have locked by mobility. They don't get locked into combat necessarily. They might, but not necessarily. Again, the cavalry can probe and light cavalry have a bit more of a chance than heavy cavalry of, of withdrawing like that. So that is a beautiful thing, is that it's not um definite. It's not that it's just that you know skirmishers mean you're not locked into the um zone of engagement or cavalry are not locked in, it, there's a chance and it's built into the combat table. So you are engaged, but you might be able to withdraw. I like that very much. Then another thing um, which they have, maybe if I get a bit closer and you can actually see a table better. Although with this lighting, I'm not sure how well that's showing up for you all. Does that help? Okay. So um, here you see a C result. Now that is counterattack. So in the counter gap, the defending unit has the option to attack the attacker back. And if you have multiple attackers, they only have to attack one of them. And then that starts another little cycle. So if, as a defender, you then get a counterattack result, then the original attacker can counterattack you. So you can get these little like, cycles of battles within battles, um, which, again, is a nice effect. Um, but then, and then... You know, um, I haven't sort of played it really enough to analyse very well um, the differences like when would you use linear and when you would you use column attack but partly it depends on where you're attacking from or to and again um, the terrain the, the, you choose your um, you choose your row here depending on the terrain and then you find the combat strength of the attacking unit or units and then you roll down, down on the column, the 1d10. Um, so uh, some terrain it's better to attack out of column from. And yeah, that's the thing, is whether the attacker or the defender are in that terrain, you use that um, row. So for example, if either the attacker or the defender's in woods, town or stream, you would use this column in linear. If they are on, no, sorry, woods or town is the top one, stream, hilltop or peak, is the next one and then clear is this one so what we find is that um, and with better results down to this end we find that to attack out of 
And if it, if they're in different terrain, you use the one most favourable to to the defender. So you get better results attacking out as column out of woods, towns, and over bridges. Um, with streams, you've got more. Um, You've got more ability from attacking in column again. Um, so, you know, it's broken down according to that. I'm sorry I can't explain it because, like I said, I didn't really sort of analyse it. Um, and then you also have, a, 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 it also depends on the results. Like I said, for skirmish, you might use that because you want to withdraw. And you have more chance of disrupting unit. And here there's more chance of causing a break, um, which... Um, could eliminate, or if you're using the advanced rules, shatter them. Shattered units have essentially eliminated units that move right back and need a commander to sort of restore them. Um, and there's more counterattacks likely on the column if you're attacking in column, at least at the higher end. And as you can see, there's less likely to happen with the lower strength points. So if you have a bigger mass, um, you're going to want to use column but not necessarily because you have more chance of a counter-attack. But then it's more effective out of certain places. So you have to make your decisions like that. And again, um, the cavalry have, you have those two choices. You have the probe where you have more withdrawal capability, but more counter-attack possibility. Um, but then when you go into an actual charge, you can go into a pursuit. Pursuit obviously can mean you can sort of continue to attack. You can have a pursuit and then a counter-attack. So if anybody survives the pursuit, Defending cavalry can counterattack. So um, that is something very interesting in that you choose your method of attack and it might depend on the terrain or what effect um, you are looking to obtain. And as I said, there's quite a lot of um, breadth of effects. So from um, disorders to breaks to counterattacks to uh, attrition possibility, which is kind of like a step loss or um, withdrawals, um, heavy cavalry effect, pursuits, counterattacks against pursuit, um, and then artillery, uh, certain results, they have to roll a training check. If they roll on the, their training check, they get the result. If they don't, they don't. Other results are definite. So there's a lot of variability in the combat and a lot of ability to to make important decisions within that so that's very interesting too um then i briefly mentioned uh, no i don't think i did because I, I, I scrapped a video just for this one because i got interrupted but um you've also got visibility and weather and there's a friction table which you can use in the um advanced game that's essentially random events it's not a huge bunch of random events but it's things like um, army morale is affected, you, reinforcements, you might get contingency reinforcements. So, for example, Rat and a couple of units can come on, or um, an observation corps can come on, as they did in my game for the um, Russians. Then you can have bad weather, or the visibility can change. If the weather is bad, then charges are worse, and some other things like that. And if the visibility is bad, well, then you might not have contact. In contact, there's a whole chart for that. Um, so it's uh, essentially gaining line of sight, um, essentially gaining sight. And uh, if you're on a hill uh, or on you have hills and then you have hills detail, the brown ones, and then you have peaks, which are even higher. So if you're on a peak, you could, you'll be able to um, observe further. So, you know, if you sight your artillery on that train, on that terrain and the visibility is good then um, you'll be able to fire it to a full heap three hexes range otherwise uh, current uh, generally visibility is only two hexes and uh, lowered perhaps if the visibility is bad so you see there's that kind of variability built into the game as well so the friction table also details intelligence and ammunition shortage and then it could be a no event um, now, intelligence comes in because as it's an option rule, but it's in the advanced rules, and I played with it, and I think many people would like to, um, is a fog of war. So um, you have your leaders, they have a fog of war side, 
and uh, this is another really interesting part in the game and then then you have units in the holding box so for example I showed you Victor from the first core there and um, this is a divisional level game in the sense that um, this is how his core is represented there's no scale given to the game so I don't know how large an area of the hexes represent but he's basically got um, three infantry divisions, two cavalry and one artillery and uh, you can see his infantry divisions are um, leadership of C, so if they have to roll on their own. In fact, all of his are C, that's very good. The French are generally all C, whilst the um, Russians were generally all F, lethargic. Um, but the, the leaders are more variable. Um, so these would all be in the holding box and they'd be unseen by the Russian player. Now, at any point that... Um, Victor came within contact range, so again you might want to be on the hilltops to see people further away on the peaks. Um, you would flip his leader unit and then you would put all these these ones down either in or adjacent to the, the hex the leader counter is in. Now if uh, um, two units um, reveal themselves at enemy and on the opposite sides at the same time, the stationary one reveals first. So if you say suddenly turn around a corner and you're adjacent to an enemy, um, he can actually plonk a unit down in your hex, pushing you, you back. And then, so, you know, the defender has the advance there because they're already in position. So you can get some interesting surprises like that, um, which again, I think is a really another neat thing about the system. Now, um, I'll go into a bit later why I think the system didn't take on because I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with it. It doesn't appear broken in any way. But I, uh, I think there's two main th reasons why it didn't take off. So, and um, what else do we have? Um, then up here we have the land chart, another thing. So you have a land chip. And this uh, battle, the French had three, the Russians had two. And the French start with three, the Russians start with one. The French regain three every turn, the Russians regain one every turn. And essentially you use the chits to um, improve movement or combat. Or And it's, look, they even included Britain and Prussia because it's a system. Although no, obviously they, these are not involved in the Friedland battle. Uh, the Russians can use it to improve rally capability. So again, you can choose certain points and um, um, spend your chits uh, to g gain a, a hopeful bonus um, uh, at vital stages. Um, so again, another little nice thing, just a, a little extra touch that can add that much egg, more more to tense decisions, not, not sort of difficult headbangers, but a lot more excitement and um, variability in the game. You're not just able to... Um, it's not about counting CRT factors. Um, which what else can I mention? Um, it'd be interesting. I'd like to play some other Friedland games now to see how they are handled, and if the Russian player inevitably does what I did. Um, so what else? Uh, Okay, so um, oh yes, I, I mentioned you had bridges and engineers. Um, oh yes, reaction. That was what I was thinking. Then the, the last thing is reaction. So in um, the sequence of play down here, um, you start with rolling for friction, then you bring on reinforcements if they're there then then you have movement and essentially the army commanders and also you can have detachments so with a fog of war you can have um, fake detachments you roll for them so you roll under their leadership rate and see if they are in command and you can move them or if they are impetuous or out of command etc so the army commander and anyone within his span maybe corpse commanders he's included in that decision would all move then when they're done then the corpse commanders and detachments that you've have not assigned under the army commander or out of range um you didn't or chose not to, they would then roll and move. And then finally, any combat units not covered by the other two would
good role and uh, leadership and mo possibly move. And then you get to reaction. And now this is when any adjacent enemy who's adjacent to your units will try and roll under their leadership. If they get that role, then they can react, i.e. Um, fight. So their artillery will bombard. If they had skirmishers, um, skirmish capable units, they might try to withdraw. Um, cavalry might charge, but essentially they can attack and bombard um, before you get a chance to in the assault phase. And then finally there's a rally phase because each combat unit has a disorganized side, which is part of the combat effect. So it's um, less, uh, slightly less movement and uh, more easy to eliminate. Um, so that reaction thing is also nice. Um, coupled with the fog of war and the possible surprise of as enemy units deploy, um, it's great. And it's also that fog of war is always nice in these war games whereby, say, you have um, reinforcements coming on, uh, essentially you only have, you only need to bring on the leader counter and that could represent, as I showed you, six counters. So you don't have to be moving six counters each turn until he gets to where someone's going to see him. You just bring him on and then when he's at an important place, you can reveal him and put the counters on as any time. Otherwise you just wait until you get to the point of decision or point of contact and uh, and deploy your troops. Lovely. So um, that is as much as I'm going to explain the system. The rest of it's all pretty standard stuff. Um, now, why did it not get picked up? Well, I think it's mainly for two reasons. The first one I'll mention because I've momentarily forgotten. The second one is the combat charts. Now, um, the, there's no uh, odds-based combat and there's no differential-based combat. So the strange thing is, is you can get, say for example, you've got, let's say these two units are squaring off against each other. And the French unit has a strength of nine there, and the Russian strength of two. Now, if the Russian gets to go first, first maybe via reaction, or if it's his turn, um, he could choose. Um, uh, he would he he would roll, on he, according to, the terrain, he would roll on the column, determined by his strength. So one or two, here or here. Or comparable on the skirmish chart, and and we would find his result. Now, it, there's no modification depending on the strength of the defending unit. So it, it, even if the defender was strength nine, as we have here, or two, the result would be the same. It all just depends on the strength of the attacking unit, the likelihood of gaining a disruption or a break or a withdrawal or a counterattack, etc. And that I think on war gamers bred up on yes yeah, I um uh so war game is bred on CRTs odds based CRTs which just go uh but I've got nine strength versus two strength how can you possibly have that kind of effect against me and I could only have the same effect against you would shake their heads and say this is stupid. I do, now I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Joseph Miranda may have done his research and found that generally it was not um, that this kind of this was the way it worked. It wasn't that you would have three times the strength you would cause, you'd be three times as much as likely to cause damage, and the inverse being true. It may well be in Napoleonic warfare that, um, uh, especially you know if you're in in line or or even in column versus line. I mean, he might have had to put a bit more finesse to make it a bit uh, even more realistic. But it might be that a small force can have same effect on a large force because you're not necessarily engaging the whole of a large force all at once and if some of them flee the rest that or, or you um you know break cohesion the rest may all break cohesion as well but i suspect that that was um the main death blow is that people just couldn't accept that there's not even a differential so it isn't even that um you, you know two versus nine becomes minus seven or even something more moderated than that. So um, I think people just couldn't accept that. I I, I don't know. In, in my game, it didn't seem to be a problem at all. I did lose that extremely strong French unit, and it was a terrible loss, because um, 
that um, went towards the um, uh, strength points that could have potentially brought a victory for the Russians. Interestingly, again, that was an elite um, uh, French unit. So when that is lost, then it's four points to army disintegration. A veteran unit, three points. Um, like the rabble Cossacks units are only one point towards army disintegration. But the Cossacks units of five would um, be one point to army disintegration, but five points towards army um, strength points lost. So you see how that works in the victory conditions. So um, as a, f which was interesting because then it meant that I might, should have perhaps been more cautious on using this strong um, French unit. And you might just throw your hands up and say, oh, well, that is rubbish because, um, you know, then that means that I'm just uh, sort of with ho holding back my strong units and sending the small units to do all the damage. Um, I don't know, maybe in the abstraction of it, that works all right because the smaller units are representing detachments from the, the larger. I don't know. Um, the overall battle felt fine for me, albeit that it was kind of a strange battle because it was uh, we had the Prussians really just kind of, uh, the Russians just withdrawing. Um, so it was essentially a fighting withdrawal. I didn't have a, a set piece battle. That would be interesting to see. But yeah, I think that was the killer blow because it's not um, odds based or differential. Um, people couldn't wrap their heads around it. And I'd be very interested um, to find uh, somebody speaking to that, even Joseph Miranda. Um, that would be great to hear about the justification for that. As I said, it didn't, it, uh, you know, I'm willing to take a system as it is and not throw it out because it's not what I am used to. Um, I, I'm happy to compare the two, um, but I'm happy to leave this on its merits. And it played out a battle that seemed quite reasonable um, to me. You know, I can imagine exactly the same sort of results occurring with a normal odds-based CRT. Um, it wouldn't have been exactly the same, you know, I wouldn't have maybe wouldn't have lost that big unit to a smaller unit in the same way, uh, with the same immediate um, chance, but the overall results seemed comparable. Um, then the other thing that I think um, killed it was perhaps the command control. And so... Um, the fact that you on the impetuous results you had to be impetuous I mean, so i think people perhaps didn't like that straight jacket although you do have it in other ways and maybe not so generalized but for maybe specific commanders in, in other games but i feel that perhaps that was um that could be a bit irksome to some people because um for example in the sense of like nay is is dubbed um aggressive and so more likely to be impetuous is he always that way i mean you could it could obviously have changed from scenario to scenario depending on the historical um event but um i don't know it produced an interesting game for me and i enjoyed it um but i suspect that that kind of straight jacketing even though it's on a die roll and maybe that also the fact that it's a die roll could cause frustration yeah that was it that's what i was thinking as i was playing it, is that you can't always get to do what you want to do so again i'm back in 1992 was that before chip paul really came in no i think it must have come in by then it's another it's, so this was another kind of variation on that kind of chip Paul idea so people are trying out different ideas and I think that this leadership um, rating mechanism worked for me, but I can imagine some people would prefer something else. So um, I think I'd better wrap it up. It's been quite long enough, double the sort of length that I expected, but I hope I've done a bit of justice to this game, Friedland 1807, from the Napoleonics battle non-system, um, which Joseph Miranda tried to bring into existence and uh, again I'd like to see more about why it didn't continue and uh, wonder if there's any fan made um, further iterations out there.